Okay, so good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's uh, a great honor to be here and have this very first um, parallel session uh, with the topic Water Energy Nexus in the Alps. My name is Rafaela Schinecker and I'm associated with the Institute of Hydrobiology and Aquatic Ecosystem Management at the BOKU here in Vienna. And uh, together with my colleagues Helga Kremser, Susanne Muha and Stefan Schmutz from our institute, but also with uh, Sascho Schantl, Ale Spisiak and Lucia Maroth, who is also um, the reporter of our session. Um, we organized uh, this event uh, here and we are honored uh, that we can uh, present it here because we are working uh, on a project on the Alpine Space, which is another funding instrument by the um, European Union. So this project is called AIM, Alpine Space in Movement, and it's focusing on uh, water and energy capitalization. So over here you can see the word nexus, and uh, when we saw the uh, outline, the first outline of this conference, we applied for a special session as we are working on harmonizing energy and uh, aquatic ecology in this project. Uh, and um, we decided to go for this nexus. We heard today that there is a lot of uh, discussions going on on the nexus itself, but we wanted to integrate it into this session um, because it's a very important topic and it's a very broad range, but you will see just uh, in a minute. I also want to mention our other colleagues that are working on the AIM project. It's RSE in Milan, so it's an energy uh, research company. And then also I am uh, in France, which is um, the um, association of the European uh, mountain regions. Uh, first of all, I want to give you an overview about the objectives of the session itself. So um, we um, want to get an idea about the meaning and the complexity of this water energy nexus in the European Alps first. And we also want to brainstorm through a pool of tools because we heard today that tools and best practice examples are quite interesting or important. So we want to go through these approaches and guidances that already were uh, addressed by related European projects and uh, activities. So we will see some examples from a national and a pan-alpine level, but also from the Danube Basin. And uh, afterwards, because we also were asked to bring in some more um, innovative or more open um, aspects into this session, uh, we want to discuss the better harmonization of interests and the integra integration of decision making um, with you here, uh, with the session participants in an interactive part. So uh, first of all, we will hear, I will change my hat in a minute, and I will give a short introduction into this water energy nexus topic, followed by my colleague Helga Kremser, who is talking about the AIM project. Then we will have uh, three examples, as said before, about tools and approaches to harmonize hydropower and aquatic ecosystem um, conservation. And unfortunately, there also was um, a presentation from Sweden scheduled, but uh, Daniel was not able to come. So we have a bit more time um, for discussion and also for the interactive work and, of course, for the coffee break. Um, to give you an overview about the work session, which will take approximately one hour, uh, with the focus also on the nexus, it will be a facilitated group work, so you can see that we already prepared some flip charts over here in three corners. So uh, afterwards, we really would appreciate if you also participate in this interactive part, and if we can discuss in three groups about your experiences related to this harmonization of interests, then also how to improve, in your opinion, common decision making when we really talk about integration of administration and implementation of these um, tools or processes. And if you know some further tools or methods or expert studies that are related to uh, the water um, energy harmonization or nexus. And of course, there will be a session plenary, so if you directly contribute to this interactive part, um, your opinion is also included uh, in the conference uh, statement later, later on, because we will have to prepare a summary of this session. Uh, but now um, I want to start with the short introduction of this uh, water energy nexus. 
um, especially for the Alps. We heard today that um, for the Danube River, for the Sava River, there is already some um, nexus attempt or um, approaches going on um, driven by international organizations or by JRC, so by uh, uh, some institutions. This is at the moment not the case for the Alps, but however, there are some uh, nice definitions that um, we have available from the UNECE, the uh, European uh, Economic Commission uh, of the United Nations. So uh, just as a background or challenge, we all know that uh, there is population growth, there is uh, economic development, and there is increased um, energy and uh, food needs as a consequence. And these um, issues all exert an increasing pressures on our natural resources. And on the other hand, the development needs, they have to be met in a sustainable manner uh, without compromising the functioning of ecosystems. So when we talk about ecosystem uh, services and green infrastructure in the future, we all have to have the functioning of the ecosystem um, ahead of this. Um, also in a transboundary setting, and here in the Alps we are pretty often in a transboundary uh, setting, the trade-offs and the externalities um, often cause friction between the riparian countries and different interests. So over here is the nexus definition according to the UN ECE. It's an intersectoral, it's more or less an intersectoral approach to manage the interlinked resources. So in the middle there is our available water resources um, and there is the water supply, the food security, food security and the um, energy security around. Um, and the main aims are to enhance the security of these three targets, big targets, let's say, by increasing efficiency, reducing the trade-offs, and also building synergies, and most important, so um, this is very much linked to policy now, is also improving governance across sectors. So this is really the, the link to different levels of policies of national, transnational, and um, European policies. Um, another issue, because we are talking about the European Alps, I want to give you at a glance some uh, short facts about the European Alps. We all know that this uh, is a geographical unit and a part of Europe, of course, but it's also an ecological unit and a socio-economic unit. A living space for humans, animals and plants for millennia already. And um, the di diversity of this nature and the cultures is an asset for sustainable development. Since the year 1991, we also have the Alpine Convention, which is an international treaty between the Alpine countries and the European Union. And it's aiming to promote a sustainable development in the Alpine area, and also protecting the needs and the interests of the people living there. Um, as I said before, there is no um, certain uh, water energy nexus or water energy food nexus for the Alps present at the moment, but uh, the Alpine Convention has raised platforms on water management, energy and ecological uh, networks several years ago already, and these are, let's say, a basis to build on for this um, water and energy nexus. Um, over here, not only um, to show you some words, but also uh, a map. Here is the so-called Alpine Arc. So this is the borders of the Alps according to the Alpine Convention. And you can see that there is also a share of the biggest um, river basins in Europe. So the uh, Danube, the Rhine, the Rhone, the Po, uh, the Eastern Alps, and so on. But now coming um, deeper into the topic, so we talk about the water energy nexus from a wider perspective where a lot of different uh, issues are integrated. But basically, and this comes also from our project AIM, um, it's about um, hydropower and aquatic ecosystem conservation and the um, harmonization of these two issues. So we know that hydropower is the most uh, important renewable energy resource in the Alpine area, but on the other hand, we know that it has severe effects on the aquatic ecosystem when we're thinking about minimum environment flow, hydropeaking, hydromorphological alterations, and many others. The importance of these 
topics or issues is also addressed in two EU directives. The first one that wasn't mentioned before today, but it's also part of the water energy food nexus as the others, is the directive on renewable energy sources, the RES-E directive, and then we have the water framework directive, of course. The RES-E directive is aiming to increase the share of re renewable energy by 20% in 2020. But, of course, it's also an issue, and that's where we come um, more to a nexus approach, so to the integration of various sectors, also uh, from an alpine perspective. Uh, what about the habitats directive, the Natura 2000 integration, or other protected areas? What about the floods directive, and so on? Um, I also want to... Um, make a, an advertisement for a session tomorrow, because when we talk about the status of the Alpine rivers, there's just a study out of the WWF um, Alpine um, Committee, um, and it's a first, very first comprehensive overview about the status of the European Alps, including uh, maps on barriers, ecological status, and so on. So today we heard from the EA that the second uh, river basin management plans will be out soon. So this is also an issue uh, in terms of harmonization of planning that uh, the data and also the um, overview of this data has to be provided in order to have uh, yeah, strategic or superior planning. So uh, what is needed in Europe? Um, is um, the capitalization and harmonization of EU um, water and energy policies. So not only of the Water Framework Directive with the Habitats and the Floods Directive, but also with the RES-E Directive uh, to include these sectors. So this could be the, or is the interlinkage to the water, energy, and also food nexus in the Alps. And um, before I head over to my colleague, I also want to state a question. So what is the adequate definition of the territory of the European Alps? Over here in white, you can see the Alpine Arc as defined by the Alpine Convention. Uh, and it's also showing the largest uh, protected areas in the Alps. But um, as we are mainly talking about a catchment management approach, we know that um, many of the larger cities and of the areas are lying in the lowlands. So for example, um, Munich, Lyon, Vienna, Milan, all these um, metropole areas, they're um, outside of this Alpine arc, uh, but there is a lot of interlinkages. So therefore, if we skip between these uh, two images, over here you can see the Alpine Space Territory, which is more or less the territory for funding of the Alpine Space Interreg attempts. And it also soon will be the space for the uh, macro region for the Alps. So as for the Danube, a macro region for the Alps is in uh, preparation. And um, it's really following uh, up uh, the, this um, subsidiary principle so that um, the cities um, outside of this um, Alpine Convention arc are related to the Alps and also from a water management perspective this will more and more uh, lead into a catchment approach. But now I want to head over to Helga Kremser to introduce the AIM project. Thank you very much, Rafaela. Um, a warmly welcome also from my side. And the project AIM is co-funded by the European Regional Development Fund in the frame of the European Territorial Cooperation Programme Alpine Space. And the Alpine Space Programme is facing um, some challenges as during the year Alpine Space period 2007 to 2013, uh, a lot of projects in the fields of water resource management, renewable energy production, and the conservation of aquatic ecosystem addressed several open questions and needs, uh, reaching, significant, um, reaching significant results and also getting in contact with key stakeholders. But however, the project achievements did not address and serve all needs and open questions of the entire Alpine space regions in the related fields. So some major challenges remain as mainly policy and decision makers often are not reached by the Alpine space 
results. The uh, Alpine Space in Movement project, the main fact, so AIM focuses on the capitalization of the achievements of several Alpine Space projects and will highlight unanswered questions and topics. So AIM also addresses relevant actors at AU, national and regional level, and will provide a guidance for setting the scene of Alpine Space Program for the new programming period 2014 plus. This will happen by the end of the year. And this all is combined with specific dissemination actions, seminars involving key stakeholders from all interesting parties. From, um, with, um, we had some seminars, also interviews, uh, for sure, we have web communication and we will provide some publications. So, uh, very briefly, the projects from the Alpine Space Program we selected for capitalization are mainly SHARE, Sustainable Hardware Power in Alpine River Ecosystems, which has developed a decision support system to merge river ecosystem services and hydropower requirements using a multi-criteria analysis methodology, the CESAM share MCA methodology. Also, I want to mention eConnect, restoring the web of life, which has developed the Chekami tool, which is an online tool for decision makers based on geographic information systems, where it's possible to make connectivity analysis of river and landscapes, the tool is called in the short Chikami, online available. Then there was the follow-up project, Recharge Green, which has developed tools and recommendations for assessing potential renewable energy impacts on bio biodiversity and, and ecosystem services, which could be used as part of a strategic environmental assessment procedure. Also shortly to mention SEAP Alps, uh, which supports local authorities in the implementation of sus sustainable energy action plans. The Alp Water Scarce Project, which developed a water scarcity index, and last but not least, the SEDALP Project, which deals with sediment management in the Alpine region. So we looked in those projects and um, analyzed the tools and the products and uh, tried to analyze where were the gaps, what um, was um, running good, what, um, was, what we missed still to fulfill everything. As I talked before, we also, a, a, very, a big uh, pillar of the project is to involve key stakeholders. And this was done by now by uh, panel discussions with key stakeholders. We have had really fruitful con, um, um, seminar in Vienna last year, and uh, also in Ljubljana and um, in Munich. We had some interviews with key stakeholders and um, passed in October in Meshev in France. And um, we organized it on four tables. We used the World Cafe method. So on each table, we, we, we had four tables with the topics aquatic ecosystem conservation and restoration, water management, including hydropower, the stakeholder involvement, and decision makers and related processes. And we asked them, what are the needs in the related topic? What are the measures? And what, in their opinion, are the key priorities and the strategic orientation the Alpine Space Program period 2014 should go on. And very shortly to sum up the main outcomes and so the main priorities, we will, we will um, advise the um, Alpine Space Program authorities um, within those topics. The first topic, aquatic ecosystem conservation and restoration is that we need the integration of conservation issues into strategic planning, so the so-called master plan. We need really um, a big issue and really difficult to harmonize, but the, the, the huge amount of data which, which is achieved in all those projects and gathered 
really have to, um, to be harmonized, to, to be used, uh, to be open and to be used to everybody, and the evaluating ecosystem services. Second topic, the water management, including hydropower. We firstly need to improve the communication and product transfer to the end users so that they are used, really. The need for harmonization of correlating tools and products with issues and solutions and promoting good practices and successful experiences. We need to define and support common policies valid for the entire Alpine Space region related to water management and hydropower projects, including the role of water storage, adaptation to climate change, and energy ecosystem sustainability. Third topic, stakeholder involvement. At the very first point, there is, we need to involve the stakeholders before the solution development, so we really do something they need. Therefore, we need a clear definition of groups and the requirements of those groups. And yeah, <laughs> we need sustainable projects addressing the needs of the society and taxpayers, so the financial sustainability. Last but not least, decision-making processes. The decision makers have to be involved in the project preparation phase. So what do they need? What can we do so that they have the feeling we work in a project on the issues they later on um, will implement. Therefore, we also need to improve the communication and collaboration between the different levels on the EU, the national, the regional, and uh, also the local level. And we need to investigate the needs of the decision makers to really do what they need and what will be implemented and used after when the project comes to an end that it will sustainable. Last slide. <laughs> so the AIM partnership um, wants to invite you to participate at the final event which will take place in November in, in Mestre near Venice in Italy. Uh, it's free of charge, so just go there and enjoy. <laughs> and um, we will ask the participants to discuss about remaining transnational issues mainly on the water energy nexus, as well as possible um, uh, solutions and ideas. So come and join us in November. Thank you. Well, and welcome everybody. Um, yeah, enhancing transparency in hydropower development. Uh, today I want to present our approach to balance conflicting aims of energy provision and conservation. A short outline <clears throat> of the presentation. First I want to spend some words on the background of our study. Then I will present in short our HICON model, HICON for hydropower and conservation. Uh, then I will get a little bit deeper into, the, into our methods, um, the identification of conservation needs based on ecological criteria and the assessment of hydropower attractiveness based on economic criteria. Then I will present some selected results and finally I will spend some words on our conclusions. Um, yeah, the background of the study. Uh, in the year 2012, the Austrian Ministry of Life published the Austrian Water Catalogue. Uh, which defines important assessment criteria regarding uh, sustainable hydropower development. And these criteria uh, cover the aspects regarding energy, ecology, and some other water management related criteria. Um, but the Austrian Water Catalog um, does not include an approach on how to combine all these criteria to an overall assessment. Um, so, um, an instrument was needed uh, to identify projects with high energy efficiency on the one hand and least conservation concern on the other hand, um, based on economic and ecological criteria. Uh, the situation today in Austria regarding hydropower, at the moment at the scale of rivers larger, with a catchment larger than 10 square kilometers, uh, we have more than 3,000 existing hydropower plants represented by the red dots, um, and some other 102 um, more projects which are in the planning phase at the moment and our study focused on these uh, planned projects. So what was our approach, the HICON approach? Um, first, it was on the national scale, and we addressed rivers with a catchment area above 10 square kilometers. 
Uh, first of all, we uh, created a hydropower plant database, which included all these 102 projects and the most important information about these projects, so like uh, installed capacity or specific investment costs, costs and also the location are represented by coordinates. Um, so we could uh, locate these hydropower plants, these projects, on our river system. In a second step, we defined the impact sections of each hydropower project. And for the evaluation of the conservation concern of each uh, project, we defined uh, some ecological criteria and intersected these criteria with the, uh, with the impact sections. Um, then we defined also six possible uh, future scenarios, conservation scenarios, and rated all these ecological criteria depending on this scenario. Um, in addition, we uh, conducted an um, analysis of the hydropower attractiveness, uh, which was based on energy economic criteria. And together, these two evaluations uh, led to an ecological economic evaluation of uh, the projects. And all this together is this HICON model, the HICON approach, which may serve as a de decision support system. Um, yeah, the methods. Uh, yeah, first we wanted to identify conservation needs based on some, ecologi um, some ecological criteria. Altogether, we formed eight groups out of more than 40 criteria. It were, um, these were eight thematic groups, um, namely the ecological status, the hydromorphological status, uh, some selected key habitats like lake outflow, for example, um, some selected key species, in general these were threatened species like the Danube sal salmon or the freshwater pearl mussel. Um, also um, still existing floodplain forests. Then we had uh, legal protected sites with strict restrictions like national parks where hydropower should be excluded by definition and some other protected sites like protected landscapes. And finally we had um, the last, last group consisted of reflowing sections and migration corridor of medium distant migrating fish species. So this was our ecological criteria. Um, just to give you an idea of the reasons why we selected um, several uh, special uh, ecological criteria, here we have the distribution of the Danube salmon in Austria. Uh, as you can see in the map and also in the graph, um, today only 14% of the population has uh, excellent or good conservation status. So it's impossible for this species um, to um, stop, um, um, <laughs> so I've lost the word, um, to, yeah, to, to increase the habitats and um, to, yeah. <laughs> Another example are the flapping forests. We have here more or less the same picture at the moment, the uh, remaining flapping forests in Austria, only 5% of these um, areas have an outstanding conservation relevance. So it's also very important to protect these last outstanding or intact um, flapping forests in Austria. So these are just two examples. Um, yeah, after we defined the ecological criteria, we developed six conservation scenarios to cover um, possible future developments. And these scenarios ranged from highest conservation need to lowest conservation need. And depending on this scenario, we uh, rated each ecological criteria to cover these scenarios. Um, and we had a scoring of, of five points, more or less. Um, this ranged from low uh, conservation conflict potential to exclusion of hydropower. And of course, the maximal conservation scenario has the highest amount of exclusion criteria and also of very high rated criteria. And when we go down to the minimal conservation scenario, you see we have only about 5% of the criteria where exclusion criteria, but we also have a high number of uh, high, medium, and also here some um, low rated criteria. Um, yeah, regarding the evaluation of hydropower attractiveness, this was based on eco uh, economic criteria. Here again, we had some uh, single criteria and grouped these into five thematic groups, namely uh, the economic attractiveness, security of supply, quality of supply, and climate protection. And each group then got a score from zero to five. Zero means, means not attractive and five highly attractive. And um, together, by combining these scorings, we came to an overall energy economic assessment or evaluation. 
Uh, yeah, the results in short. Um, just to bring it back to your mind, the aims of the HICON approach was to identify projects with the highest um, energy efficiency and least conservation concerns. Uh, one selected result regarding the projects is um, in, the, in the graph below, you can see the dark blue bars represent the, the largest projects that we investigated. And uh, from the energy economic point of view, they were generally rated as higher attractive than the smaller projects. The smaller the project, the less um, attractive the project was. And these large, um, yeah, altogether we had 102 projects and uh, a quarter of these projects were high, uh, were large projects. But this quarter provides more than 90% of the overall installed capacity and about two thirds of the annual production. Yeah, two thirds. Okay, uh, actually I deleted this one, so I'll skip this. <laughs> um, so yeah, the final results, a selection of our final results. So in the end, we combined the energy economic evaluation and the ecological evaluation to one combined evaluation. Um, here in this graph, the dots represent the project. The larger the project, the larger the dot. And the black bar, the, um, the black line represents the breaking line of the hydropower attractiveness. So each project that is above this line can be considered as um, attractive from the economic, energy economic point of view. Um, as an example, the maximum conservation scenario. We have here, um, as you, you can see, all, uh, you can also see here that the larger projects are in general above this line. Again, this, this result. Um, the maximum conservation scenario, more than two thirds of all projects are situated on exclusion areas, but they are attractive, but still in exclusion areas. Um, then we have something in between, and we also still have some, um, some projects that um, have a low conservation, uh, that are in low conflict with conservation needs. Uh, in contrast, the minimal conservation scenario here we don't have any exclusion projects and also we don't have um, any project that is, has a very high conflict potential, but um, we have some high conflict potentials, uh, but the most of the projects, more than half of the projects have low or medium uh, conflict potential, conservation conflict potential. So our conclusions from our project, just to summarize the most important results, a high share of the analyzed projects here is in conflict with conservation needs in almost every scenario. Only in the minimal conservation scenario, which I showed you just a second before, more than half of the projects seem to be ecologically accept acceptable, so they have medium or low conservation conflicts. And another important uh, result is this ha that half of the projects are considered as not attractive from the energy economic point of view, and therefore the implementation should be um, reflected critically. Um, so what are our overall conclusions? Um, for decision making, it is very important to provide, provide well-processed data and transparent results. It's always an issue of data. <laughs> um, yeah, the results indicate that we need to reconsider the national uh, hydropower development and also should start to deal with limitation of hydropower use. And finally, uh, further hydropower development plans um, should base on a large-scale assessment and they should um, also integrate conservation needs and energy economic aspects. Um, so now I was much faster than I thought. <laughs> this was our project in short. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, you just saw the example of the Austrian case and we would like to present our example, how we manage the issue, how to harmonize the, let's say, water, uh, water usage uh, issues with the preservation or conservation issues. Uh, maybe two different changes, uh, to, if we compare them, our results or our methodology to Austrian, that actually we didn't took, for example, for hydropower plant, we didn't took uh, specific case studies or specific uh, locations uh, for hydropower plants, but we checked the water courses in whole. And also we took the challenge not to only discuss or evaluate the hydropower water use, 
but actually all the water uses which are relevant or should be, let's say, uh, discussed or evalu evaluated is... Uh, you should use a uh, microphone. ...should be evaluated in certain uh, water, uh, water basin, rear basin. So, uh, uh, the project was carried in during the, in, in within the CAMIS project. This is the bilateral project between uh, Slovenia and Italy. And uh, we tried to manage, to define the water uses and their sustainability, sustainable development in this upper Socha basin as a pilot case. So, main uh, needs uh, and challenges we have to dealt at the beginning was how to manage all the uh, water management issues. For example, uh, on one side we have uh, objectives to reach a good ecological status. Uh, we have to protect uh, the uh, settlements from the flood and erosion risk management and also we have to consider all the existing and future water uses which are, which are present in certain area or in certain basin. So major challenge was uh, how to harmonize the crossfire objectives. For example, we all know that the objectives from the uh, renewable energy sources, hydropower, uh, compared to good uh, ecological uh, status objectives are not uh, well harmonized. So uh, we find out that, uh, like for example in Austrian case, when they dealt with the entire Austrian territory, we also found out that we have to deal with larger areas, especially to provide the data to compare uh, in between. So we found out that we need the uh, support, methodological support, which is subjective, transparent, and of course repetitive. And of course we found out that uh, all the sectors who are, uh, uh, of which the objectives are dealt should be a part of this process. Uh, so the project comes in whole uh, uh, try to support the development of the Socha Basin, uh, cross-border Socha Basin, uh, from different issues, for example, how to improve the touristic attractiveness, how to improve the uh, status uh, development issues of the parks which are there, and also one of the topics was to model different uh, water uses, what was the challenge of our institute. Uh, at the beginning, we tried to give the stakeholders uh, the, uh, the approach to, uh, to see how we, will try to the, how we will try to manage the different water uses which are relevant for this area. Uh, and uh, we will try to develop the models which will support the strategic decision uh, and also the harmonization of uh, national and, and EU objectives from different uh, directives. So the spatial planners on the local level, we get different maps of different water uses and on the basis of economical anal analysis, uh, system sustainability and self-efficiency, they can actually decide which kind of water uses they can uh, plan in the future for certain uh, water course or certain basin. The catchment area, uh, uh, selected was the upper part of Socha River with main tributaries uh, where uh, it is about 1,500 square kilometers in size. It considers about five, it considers five local communities uh, and the mode, uh, so the to uh, we excluded the water sections, uh, the water areas with the catchment size less than 10 square kilometers like the, the same situation with the Austrian example. So the total length of the water courses analyzed is about 300 kilometers. Uh, on the basis of the stakeholder uh, discussions, uh, we found out that uh, hydropower, fish farming, bathing areas, and also fishery uh, to, uh, were appropriate sites to access water courses. Uh, water courses should be defined uh, where the water uses we analyzed. For example, maybe someone can question that why we didn't uh, consider the uh, water supply, but we decide so because the water supply is actually the prime uh, water use and is actually quite well defined in between the state and local level and uh, water uh, and they are not uh, closely directly related to the uh, flow, free, free flowing uh, water courses. 
So to provide the results would be much more agree agreeable on the end of the project, we plan, uh, we planned, uh, and we are, the process is still going on because the project is not finished yet, uh, extensive uh, communication with stakeholders from the beginning where we explain the problem, uh, we explain the method, then we define the main criteria, the supporting criteria, weighting, and so on. And at the final phase is when also the validation of the results came out and uh, the final synthesis with the conclusions and pro provision of the results to the stakeholders. So, mentioned again, our results are mainly uh, are on the strategic level, so they can give us support for a more detailed spatial planning, environmental impact assessment, and so on. The method is based on the multi-criteria approach, where we define the uh, alternatives. So, for example, uh, alternatives in Austrian case are the considered hydropower uh, uh, design uh, schemes. Uh, in our case, we decided to go that each water course, each 50, uh, uh, divided by 50 on 50 meters, is one alternative. So we are comparing the water courses 50 meters in length uh, in between. This is the case for hydropower. The case for other water uses, where also riparian area is important, uh, we decided to uh, divide the riparian area in the similar cells, in the cell size of five meters by five meters. So these are all the alternatives. For example, if you are considering the hydropower, we have 300 kilometers uh, uh, water courses, length of the water courses, analyzed water courses. We came out about 5,000 uh, with the 5,000 alternatives. So, next step, we select the main criteria uh, and the scoring method. I will try to give this explanation in, uh, in the following slides. We have to define the utility function, so how to evaluate each section according to the selected criteria. Uh, for example, hydropower uh, potential is calculated, so we have to define how each section is evaluated by this hydropower potential. Utility, we have to provide a normalization that the results are comparable. Then, according to the, at first, according with, on the basis of the stakeholder uh, discussions uh, and questionnaires, we define the weights of this uh, criteria, of, of the selected criteria. And then we provided the, uh, then we perform a suitability analysis and on the basis of the results validation, maybe we can do, can find an agreement. Otherwise, the process can be returned on the previous stages where additional, select, uh, additional criteria and other uh, parameters of analysis can be changed until the decision is agreed. So, compared to um, guidances, Alpine guidances, ICP, ICPDR guidances on the hydropower, we decided to split uh, environment and landscape issues into two, uh, into two different aspects, main aspects. So we came out with three-dimensional area. The main reason for that, maybe it's not uh, applicable for, it is not su suitable to apply it for the bigger areas, but main reason for that was that we, the Socha River, Upper Socha River is very well known by their pristine waters. The tourism is very, very well developed and there are a lot of sightseeing when the nature can be really nicely observed. So we, have, so we put additional stress to the landscape. So uh, in the method, we normalize everything, and this is the, the result. So we get the results for each, uh, for each criteria, for main criteria. And you can see all the alternatives could be, should be situated in this uh, cube. So the suitability finally is then calculated by uh, the summation of those results, and for example, the most suitable areas, uh, sections, or areas for certain water use should be closer to the number three, and not uh, suitable, and or maybe suitable for conservation issues should be close to one. And this field, you can see, we have this yellow color here. This is actually the, when the stakeholder K part, how they can move closer to the conservation area or not close. So the yellow part is actually left for the further decisions. Uh, we also have a lot of agreement what kind of colors we should use. 
for example, usually for us who are dealing a lot of this, this uh, green, yellow and red color scheme is quite acceptable. But it can give some wrong impression or some wrong information to, let's say, stakeholders or investors who are actually more involved in some water use issues. So this subject should be discussed more, uh, the color scheme. Okay, I will not go in detail in the method. So we calculate on the basis of the utility functions the, all the criteria and then sum to the main criteria and the final result. So these are all the indicators we used. For example, uh, for the hydropower attractiveness, these are the, the we, are, we are still working on. We have this erosion risk, risk we will also include. This was done on the basis, this, is, this was suggested by the environmental agency because they have a lot of problems in this area a lot of erosion and they would like to put more attractiveness to this water section which are uh, found to the erosion risk. So this is, these are all the criteria. Uh, so we can uh, give you some preliminary results. These are not the final results because the decision maker should be done. But we can, you can see how the results for, for example, for hydropower attractiveness could be uh, given, for example, you can see on the upper right corner, uh, the darker blue color represents more attractive or more suitable, more attractive for such for certain water use. Uh, you can see for the fishing site, that means for the parking spaces, uh, where the maybe we forgot in this issue because I may, uh, remember it today. Uh, that fishing spaces are really important, especially because to prevent the. Uh, Invasive, invasive or non-native uh, uh, non uh, species. So they have to be equipped with, I don't know, with some cleaning equipment and so on. Uh, this is now the final result for the example of the, uh, of the suitability. We can see we have all three main criteria and this is the final result. The red lines represents the, actually the existing hydropower plants which are considered as small in Slovenia, but considering the Austrian uh, terminology, they are considered like a micro or mini hydropower plants. They are more or less really small. Uh, outcomes, let's say the methodology is quite objective, transparent, it can be repeatable, we can change the criteria, we can add the criteria and the results, uh, everybody can, uh, could, reach the, could uh, get the same results. Main challenges, of course, the data should be available. You saw, uh, for example, we, we were not able to apply the criteria uh, uh, lateral uh, barriers because all the water courses were not, the data for uh, the barriers for all the analyzed water courses were not included. Uh, were, uh, were not included. Uh, we didn't include, in this phase, we didn't include exclusion areas, uh, but they can be simply uh, added by the conditioning. A lot of uh, micro hydropower plants are situated outside of these uh, sections of, of, uh, with the catchment size more than 10 square kilometers. How to deal with the future in the future with those hydropower plants? Especially, we also, you also recognize that really small hydropower plants are not very in accordance to the, let's say, the objectives of energy production. On one side, also they have a lot of they put a lot of stress on the conservation issues. Uh, developed method uh, is a viable approach. It can be, if it is uh, implemented in regional and uh, national level, it can support the justification, how to provide, to, uh, to justify the exemption. Uh, it is very important that the multi-sectors multi are uh, involved in the process. For example, like you in Austria, you prepared this data by the WWF, but you still didn't get the answer from the uh, hydropower sector and uh, especially today now today uh, opportunities uh, that according to Austrian approach uh, to our approach from Slovenia uh, sorry that the colleague from Sweden was not able to come because he, he would probably explain or give some additional other approach and uh, of course uh, you're welcome today to knowledge exchange to support to develop some method or methodology which would be apply, applicable on uh, in different countries or in different regions okay thank you very much sorry to be too long
Hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to mention uh, uh, I try to present this uh, working paper on behalf of my general manager, Ovidiu Gabor, and my colleague, uh, Graziela Jula, which are the members of uh, Hydropower uh, uh, Working uh, Expert uh, Group. Uh, the name of the presentation is guiding, uh, guiding Principles on Sustainable Hydropower Development in the Danube River uh, Basin. The content of the presentation uh, is following general overview regarding energy and water and the ICPDR role to development of uh, this guide. Uh, guiding uh, principles on sustainable hydropower development in the Danube uh, uh, Basin and development of hydropower project uh, like general principle. Uh, here you have a map with an overview uh, uh, regarding the Danube River Basin District uh, and all the country from the uh, Danube uh, District. Uh, like a general overview uh, regarding energy and water, uh, we can say the Danube country, countries are committed to the implementation of water, nature and other env uh, environmental legislation and the Water Framework Directive being the key tool for water policy in the entire Danube River Basin. Also, the Danube country are committed in reaching the objective of the directive regarding the promotion of the use of energy from renewable sources till 2020. Also, the production of hydro energy will increase in most Danube countries till 2020, and uh, the graph uh, shows the electricity production uh, hydropower uh, currently and uh, expected uh, uh, till 2020 in the Danube uh, Basin. Uh, because the Water Frame dir Directive and uh, uh, it was the key of uh, this uh, guide. Uh, we can say the discussion has show, uh, shown that more holistic approach for hydropower use are needed. And the uh, workshop uh, participant uh, recognized the advantages of a planning mechanism to facilitate the identification of uh, suitable areas for new hydropower uh, projects. Uh, because uh, the guide uh, it was uh, elaborated uh, under ICPDR role and the Hydro Energy Expert Group, uh, it was based to the Danube Declaration uh, from uh, 2010 and also from the Danube Strategy, um, like uh, European uh, legislation. Uh, another products, products of the uh, ICPDR are the assessment report on hydropower generation in the Danube Basin, uh, guiding principles on sustainable hydropower development in the Danube Basin, and also the case studies and good practice examples regarding hydroenergy. Uh, here in this map, you can see uh, the, hydro, the situation of hydropower plants uh, on the entire uh, Danube River Basin with uh, uh, diverse uh, uh, capacity generation of uh, ener uh, energy, like small, medium and large uh, hydropower. Uh, this guide, um, uh, it's... Uh, Uh, for the second part of the presentation, like uh, guiding principle for sustainable hydropower development, we can uh, talking about uh, general principles, technical upgrading of existing hydropower plants and ecological restoration, strategic planning approach for new hydropower development, and also the mitigation measure. Uh, this guide is addressed uh, primarily uh, to public bodies and co component authorities responsible for the planning and authorization of hydropower, uh, to the potential investors in the hydropower sectors, and also to another NGOs and uh, other public interest. Uh, like general principles, uh, we can um, 
talking about sustainability, uh, which is focusing on hydropower production and the conservation of the aquatic ecosystem. Uh, also, in addition, uh, for the flood protection on water uses, other national or regional objectives and constraints, general environmental aspects, including changes in freshwater ecosystem, and also to the socio-economic uh, aspects. Another principle is the holistic approach in the field of energy policies, which is uh, um, based to the Renewable Energy Directive and Energy Efficiency Directive. Uh, another uh, general principle is the contribution of different plant capacity categories to electricity generation from hydropower. And in this uh, gra uh, graph, you can see the number of hydropower station and uh, uh, hydro hydropower generation in all the uh, basin of the Danube uh, uh, district. Uh, the predicted uh, ratio between the contribution of new large and new small hydropower plants to the 2020 objective set for the overall hydropower production varies in Danube countries. Uh, also, another uh, general principle are, uh, is the consideration of hydropower types and plant capacities uh, because in some cases, hydropower plants of different size, including small hydropower plant, can be compatible with good status in case the required mitigation measures are applied, uh, or in case of existing hydropower plants, if fore foreseen by national legislation losses of hydropower generation due to the implementation of mitigation measure may be compensated. Uh, deterioration from high to good status requires an exemption from the no-deterioration no principles according to Water Framework Directive uh, Article uh, 4.7. Uh, regarding the strategy planning approach to the national or uh, regional and project specific assessment, uh, it's very important to know uh, where are the favorable, uh, fo favorable location or how we can uh, implement the technical solution. And uh, this ap approach um, uh, will be transparent and based on cr criteria uh, for two levels, national, re regional level, and uh, two specific level for the new project. Here you have a classification schema, a schema which uh, our colleague from Slovenia applied uh, also in uh, the previous um, uh, presentation. And uh, the guideline recommend a list of national regional criteria uh, re uh, in relation with the energy management environment uh, landscape and uh, uh, each of these criteria uh, is, uh, uh, has a description in the um, right part of the table. Also, uh, the guide recommend a list for project specific criteria uh, in relation with the energy management, like uh, size of hydropower plant, security of supply, quality of supply, uh, the criteria regarding environment and water management, uh, like uh, flood control, irrigation, sediment management, uh, also a uh, number of soci socio-economic uh, criteria. Uh, with uh, regional economic effects, recreation, tourism, and other uh, uh, criteria. Uh, the last part of my presentation, uh, referring to the development of hydropower project, the general principles, uh, which show uh, that hydropower should be part of a holistic approach of energy policies, a national regional hydropower strategy should be elaborated based on the, this basin wide guiding, guiding principles. Um, the public interest on national regional level uh, has to be done in a transparent way based on criteria and relevant information uh, involving public participation in an early stage of the decision making process. 
Also, hydropower development has to take into account the effect of climate change on the aquatic ecosystems, and the technical upgrading of existing hydropower plants should be promoted to increase the energy production. Also, the technical upgrading of existing hydropower plants should be linked to ecological criteria for the protection and improvement of the water status and promoted also uh, as well uh, the financially supported. Uh, the combination of technical upgrading with ecological restoration of existing hydropower install installation implies a win-win solution for energy produ uh, production on the one side and for the environmental condition on the other side. Uh, also, another um, general principles are um, is the assessment of national and regional classified opportunity for the river stretches to use their hydropower potential and incentive schemas for new hydropower project should take into account the results of the strategic planning approach and adequate mitigation measure. Because the subject of this presentation is uh, no so much technical, uh, we recommend to uh, consult the uh, website for uh, to the ICPDR uh, site because uh, you found the entire uh, document because it's a complex and very huge document. Thank you.